admit all. Hooray and welcome. Happy summer, almost July. And take a peek behind me, friends. This yarrow is so resplendent, as are you. I am so glad that we are all here this morning. And hello, Geraldine. Hello, Kira. Ah! so good to see you and I'm so delighted we have some fabulous company Rebecca and Judy and Carol and Leah and Julie what welcome friends if you would put yourselves into the chat and just say hi my name is and where are you hailing from both in the lands the tongues of what we would perhaps now say hello from Naples, New York. And if you know the indigenous lands you occupy, hello, I'm Petra from Haudenosaunee, unceded Seneca lands as well. And if you have a favorite way that you use Yarrow in your life, please share that in the chat as well. So welcome abundantly and huge thanks to Kira Avery so beautifully sharing her joy and language justice with us today. And thank you so much to Geraldine and to all of our friends and family of Fruition and Suntrap Botanical who are making it possible for us to show up with smiles on our faces and beautiful hydration in our bodies <laughs> and this great joy <laughs> to share and learn and grow together. And thank you to the ancestors, plant and human. Thank you to the future generations, plant and human, that we are just this tiny love story of today. And I'd love, love, love to, you know, Geraldine, what is your quick intro to who are we? How did we land here? Hello, Petra. Thank you for that wonderful opening. And for those who don't know me, I'm Geraldine, and I love to practice bioregional herbalism. And that is simply working with the abundant apothecary that is right outside our doors. And I love seeing that so many of you are showing up today for yarrow, a plant that is showing up all around us. I just took a walk through the meadows around where I live and yarrow is in full bloom. So it's a really perfect time to talk about yarrow and to just echo what Petra said, I would love to hear you in the comments telling us how you use yarrow because it's very likely that you have some way that you are already in relationship with these plants. And I will just say, um, I'm in Brooklyndale and I have a course called Bioregional Herbalism and Medicine Making. Um, I'm on unceded on Haudenosaunee land. And um, if you really like this information that we're um, offering through these monthly webinars, you might like to check out my course. If you have any more questions about that, feel free to send me a message after this class. And Petra, who are you? Oh, is Petra might be frozen um, because as you can see, she is in a yarrow field. And I will tell you that Petra is the wonderful grower and human behind Fruition Seeds, a large team of people growing bioregionally adapted seed in the Finger Lakes region. And today we're here to talk about yarrow together. <laughs> Um, am I frozen? Oh, okay. <laughs> it is just me. Excuse me, folks. I don't normally do this um, by myself. And today I am, you know, a little sleepy, I'll be honest with you. So if you want to help me out by shouting out in the comments and telling me um, how hard to be or how much that would help out. And I will get started in a moment if we are not rejoined by Petra. It looks like my internet is a little unstable as well. Is it something in the stars, folks? I'm really not sure. Okay, well, I am going to open up with a little interesting botanical quote about yarrow. So yarrow, Achille millifolium variety, millifolium is a member of the aster family um, and it's native to Europe and Asia. A clone of this species seems to be native to North America, Achille millifolium variety lanulosa. It can only be differentiated under a microscope. 
the two are used interchangeably. So the yarrow that you see out in the meadows and fields and waste places, it's really hard to tell if that is the naturalized one from Europe and Asia, or if it's the true native. I know some native seed companies like Prairie Moon um, don't even sell yarrow because they have such a hard time differentiating. And also because, um, you know, why sell it when it is so abundant? It's absolutely everywhere. Um, but if you do want to get some yarrow seed, go ahead and get some from fruition. I, I, I've bought their seed before and grown it in my greenhouse. And soon Petra is going to tell us all about how to start that seed, cultivate the plant and collect the seed. But since Petra is um, missing right now <laughs> in the yarrow field at Fruition Farm, um, I'm just going to jump right into the medicine of yarrow and then maybe we'll do the cultivation afterwards. And then we'll do your Q and A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat and we will definitely get to them. Okay, so the energetics of yarrow. This is a cooling and drying and constricting, mildly astringent plant. And it's unique um, in that it is a stimulating and cooling plant. Usually our stimulating plants are warming, our stimulating herbs are warming in nature, not yarrow. Yarrow is a bit cooling in nature. If you were to taste this herb, it would have a bun bitter and pungent. I almost said pungent. Can we agree that that is the word for when something is both bitter and pungent? <laughs> and it does have that astringent flavor as well, a slight tang, a tightening of the tissues. The main medicinal properties of yarrow that I'm going to talk about today are its diaphoretic and feverfuge properties, as well as those hemostatic properties that gave it its Latin name, um, as well as some vulnerary properties, and I'll mention diuretic and antiseptic properties. I'll also talk about some of my favorite ways to make medicine with yarrow, um, a couple different applications for different um, protocols, involving yarrow and I'll have to mention the energetics as well because it's an energetically potent plant um, and a lot of people resonate with the energetics of yarrow. So first things first, how do we harvest yarrow? So the best time to harvest yarrow is when it is in its peak bloom. So right now if you're in um, central New York where I am, um, and you really want to harvest those flowering tops. Petra is rejoining us on a warm and sunny day. So if your yarrow is growing in a moist area, it's going to have less of the bitter compounds than the yarrow that grows in a hot, dry, gravelly place. You know, the yarrow that has kind of, you know, poor soil, um, that soil that's not rich in nutrients, it looks a little light in color, a little gravelly that yarrow growing there is going to have the most rich medicinal constituents. And so if you can harvest from that patch on a sunny dry day, you really don't want it to have rained in the past 12 hours. You don't want cloud cover. You want a really sunny dry day. You harvest those flowering tops then. And um, that, is, that is just your best time. I think I have a quote here from Matthew Wood, one of my teachers. And he says, oh yeah, the best harvest is from sandy gravelly soil. Um, yeah, so. We're all in agreement about that. And you can always give a little nibble to that yarrow leaf to see if that flavor is right for harvesting. And basically, if it's a dry, sunny day and it is um, in peak flower, it's time to harvest. So now that Petra is back, I wonder if Petra wants to talk about the seed starting, cultivation, and um, seed saving of yarrow. And then I'll jump back and finish up the medicinal. I just talked about, Petra, just to um, catch you up, I just talked a little bit about yarrow's, um, like when to harvest yarrow, and just a, a slight introduction mm. to yarrow as a botanical um, member of the Asteraceae family and mm. one of our herbal friends. 
respect for being an on the fly, such a creative, responsive, adaptive, <laughs> resplendent human. <laughs> and yes, let's talk about seed starting. So yarrow is not the easiest, but it's not the hardest. And here's the thing. It's a perennial. And here's a little generalization about some perennial psychology. So slow and steady wins the race. They are not the first out of the gate. They take their time to heart to actually be germinating. So taking patience, having a lot of patience is pretty crucial for a lot of, a lot of perennials and the tortoise and the hare, they are totally the tortoise taking their time. So we love to start them in mini blocks on heat mats. The closer they can be to heat and warmth, that optimum germination temperature of 77%, the closer you can get it to 77, even 80 degrees, the more quickly they will just pop out of the ground. And they might still take a week or 10, 12 days, but it won't be two plus weeks like it would be just in a regular cell tray or even in soil blocks, which I also highly recommend for a lot of these plants that haven't been as cultivated as like profoundly domesticated. Yarrow, our native native yarrow looks so similar to what a lot of the cultivars are. And so I, there really isn't the profound domestication in yarrow that there has been in something like lettuce or cucumber or tomato. And so as a result of using these soil blockers so that you're actually starting them in something like soil where they can naturally air prune just makes a really big difference compared to this tiny little you know <laughs> this scenario where it's they have these blocked off like plastic boxes that they're living in that's totally not natural they really thrive in those other kinds of soil block situations and the seeds are also really small and as it's not a pure, it's not a golden rule, but as a general rule, those seeds that are smaller will take longer to germinate. So because they're so small, you really want to be sure to not be sowing them too deeply also. Unlike some flowers like snapdragons, yarrow beautifully wants to be in the dark so snapdragons do want and some some flower seeds do want flower light literally to germinate yarrow thankfully isn't one of them but it's really easy to sow yarrow way too deep because those seeds are so small and as a general rule you want to be sowing seeds twice their depth and especially when the seeds are so small, it's, it's really easy to bury them in too much soil. So then they might germinate, but then they don't have the strength to push up through the mountain relatively of soil that's on top of them. And a little thing that I love to do with those tiny little seeds, how do you pick one up? Because we only sow one seed, max two in each of these mini soil blocks. And my fingers are small but and dexterous, but they're not that small and dexterous. So taking a toothpick and then wetting it, I love to wet it on the tip of my tongue. Um, I know lots of people who love to just dunk it in a glass of water. Whatever you do, just moisten the tip. So with that moistened tip, you can have the cohesion of the water to lift up just one or two seeds, that precision, and then simply roll that toothpick on the top of that surface that you're about to sew them onto. And that is a marvelous way to be sewing <laughs> your yarrow seeds. And here's a few keys to keep in mind in terms of planning your garden. So you want to keep in mind that yarrow is a perennial. So you're going to plant it and it's going to be there for years and years and years if it's well established honestly it could be there the rest of your lifetime and for generations to come yarrow is a really tenacious perennial and you want to grow it at the beginning of the season so it establishes as with the full season as possible but honestly 
if I start, if I start yarrow here in zone five in mid July, plant it out in early August, it's going to totally establish enough in that first year so that it will thrive for uh, over winter and thrive for years to come. So even if you haven't started any yarrow yet in your life now, and you would love to know that kind of that starting seeding it in mid July here in zone five is kind of not final final call i haven't tested those boundaries but know that you've definitely got plenty of time and don't hesitate to go ahead and sow those seeds indoors and be establishing them outdoors a few weeks later and yet if you are planting them out earlier in the season even though it's a hardy perennial you want to be planting them indoors about six eight weeks before final frost and then planting it outdoors after final frost. So it's a little counterintuitive, although this plant is going to literally, when the snow is just beginning to melt, the arnica, which is just beside me here in full glorious blossom, and this yarrow beside me, they are just literally bouncing out of the snow banks, like bright green and glorious. So although ultimately they're incredibly cold hardy, that first year when you're establishing them, you don't want to be putting them outside in the snow or even in the cold. Wait for that soil to warm and for them to be establishing in that lovely warm soil. And that will help them thrive all the more. Yarrow does thrive in lots of different contexts. Geraldine was beginning to mention the wide diversity, including <laughs> the adversity that draws out, like so many of us, humans included. <laughs> <laughs> that tenacity and those compounds that are the foundation of their resilience. So, you know, I find myself saying often to my friends, you are so resilient and I wish you didn't have to be. <laughs> and the same is true for your yarrow. You can definitely plant it in you know, all kinds of very not <laughs> conducive to thriving conditions. And they'll manage to thrive most likely well-established, um, especially that first year, if you can give them a little extra water, a little extra fertility, once they're established, they're just going to thrive in some very unlikely places. Um, and that includes, you know, here we have full sun. I mean, yarrow just in its own right, just is a very Mediterranean plant style plant. So it loves the hot and it loves the dry, hence that gravelly side of the road. But if you have, you can grow yarrow in partial shade as well. You won't get as many flowers, you won't get as much foliage, but it will totally grow. So keep in mind that more light equals more leaves and more flowers, but that anything goes and they'll find their way. Other things to keep in mind, you can totally grow yarrow in containers, so don't hold back. And I love to say bigger is better. I don't love to say bigger is better, actually, but I do love to say that in the container garden context. <laughs> but know that in the similar way that yarrow is just going to be tenacious on that side of the road in that dusty, gravelly soil the same is true for a container more than many other herbs like don't do this and expect your basil <laughs> to be delicious but your yarrow can totally hack it and I love 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 to be mulching um, all of our perennials and oh, you can't quite see it perhaps but there are wood chips all through the pathways and oh I should have Oh my gosh, well, here you can see the remnants. Doesn't this look delicious? We've established wine caps in this one of our perennial beds and we've easily harvested, I mean, I don't wanna be dramatic, but easily 50 pounds of wine caps, which are essentially, they're in the Portobello family and they're just delicious. Oh my goodness, these earbuds and I. And so <laughs> it's really wonderful to be establishing this yarrow in, um, perennial beds where you can just let mycelium and wood chips and all of these perennials just do their thing. Um, so yeah, I just want to lift up a, again a few more times. The keys here are heat mats, are getting them as close to the heat mats as possible. These mini blocks are amazing. Using toothpicks so you can be really precise with the seeds and just don't hesitate to <laughs> mulch 
your perennials perennially. <laughs> and in terms of seed saving, you just want to let all of these lovely flowers not harvest them. And as soon as they start to turn that crispy brown, be go ahead and I like to go like this in my hands and as I'm taking let's pretend that this beautiful oh my gosh I just love this is summer berry, berries yarrow by the way I just love these colors so much <laughs> wow those fibers fibers are fibrous so instead of harvesting it like this, I'll let all of the petals fall off and turn brown. And then as soon as I, you'll have so much seed. So you can really experiment widely with this. As soon as you start to see them crisp golden brown, take a little umble and go like this in your hands. And the, look what happens. Look where the, what are those tiny little seeds that you can see? And if, can you squeeze them between your fingernails? And do they impress you know do they press in or are they solid little rocks because once they're solid they are perfect for seeds so go ahead you'll have so much seed it will be fairly silly so go ahead and each seed is precious yes and don't hesitate to just explore and see what the full range of that seed a maturity will look like on your plant. And the key is here in our humid climate to just as soon as they are brown, golden, to be harvesting them. Because as the rains fall, even if the rain isn't falling, the dew in the morning is so much moisture, so much humidity, and water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. So it's really important. The hardest thing about saving seed of yarrow and any dry seeded crop is just to be harvesting them promptly if you live in a humid climate like we do here in Western New York. Um, so there are some keys, friends, and oh my goodness, there's so much more to share, nuances of all of our lives, and I hope we have the rest of our lives to dive in. And in the meantime, oh my gosh, I've got my pen ready. Geraldine, I'm so ready. <laughs> Thank you so much, Petra, for telling us about Yarrow and for coming back onto this call. I have to tell everybody, I was a little tired this morning but not seeing Petra on the screen, I got a jolt of adrenaline. <laughs> so I am here and I am ready to share about some things I know about the medicine of yarrow. And I am so sure that you also know things about the medicine. So don't be shy, shout them out in the chat. In the chat. <laughs> okay, so we talked a little bit about harvesting back before, and then I mentioned the properties. I specifically was talking about um, diaphoretic, hemostatic, vulnerary, and energetics. So now I'm gonna dive into those. So hemostatic, what does that mean? That is Yarrow's fantastic ability to stop bleeding. Yarrow used to be the herb of choice for treating um, war injuries or lacerations in ancient times. Um, of course, it's named after Achilles and his famous wound to the heel. These days, the go-to is proper bandaging and pressure, but in a pinch, Yarrow will absolutely work. I have seen it work on myself. I read Petra um, in her talking about this class yesterday. I saw that it, she had a wonderful experience with Yarrow helping on a wound. Um, very recently, a friend of mine chopped her hand while cutting, um, cooking in the kitchen with a chef knife, huge laceration on her hand, grabbed some yarrow out the door on the way to the ER. Um, you know, of course, just like washed that wound really quick with a little water, put crushed up the yarrow leaves, fresh yarrow leaves, put it on her wound, bandaged it. And by the time the nurse was ready to see her in the ER and she took the bandage off, it had stitched back together and the nurse took a look at it and said yeah you don't need stitches just um, take care of this wound keep it clean um, and you should be fine. Yarrow is pretty amazing like that. One thing I have noticed about yarrow and this hemostatic property and also in talking with peers other herbalists is that it seems to work best for those deep wounds. If you get a paper cut a little a bit of yarrow crushed up fresh leaf might really not do the trick um, but
But if you are walking barefoot through the woods in a blueberry patch, um, as I was a few years ago, and you step on something and get kind of a deep cut on your foot, uh, look around for some yarrow because that is the specific indication. Those kind of deep cuts is where yarrow really comes in and can stitch right back up. And um, indeed it did in that case. You can also use it, um, the crushed leaf for insect bites and that kind of thing. But we really do see this specific indication for those deep lacerations. Um, yeah, and fortunately, yarrow is very easy to find in the woodlands, meadows, and gardens. And um, just like Petra gave us all kinds of resources for how to grow it ourselves, it's a really good idea to have on the edge of your garden, just in case. Um, Oh, here's an interesting um, little quote from Matthew Wood to move us into the next property I want to talk about, which is Yarrow's ability to be a diaphoretic, to open up the pores and break a fever. Yarrow cools by opening up the veins and allowing congestion out of the capillaries. So Yarrow has a very strong diaphoretic action. Um, traditional, a traditional T formula that I've actually mentioned before in this class, I believe, is equal parts peppermint, yarrow, and um, elderflower. So equal parts, and this is a wonderful remedy to either just sip, um, taking sips every 15 minutes. It's safe for children, adults, elderly folks, anybody who has um, you know a severe fever and they're trying to get through it to break it. This can be a wonderful way to help open up those pores, release that stagnant um, flow, help open up those pores and sweat and break a fever. Yarrow is one of the best diaphoretic herbs and is a standard remedy for aiding the body to deal with fevers. It lowers blood pressure due to dilation of the peripheral vessels. It stimulates digestion and tones the blood vessels. As a urinary antiseptic, it is indicated for infections such as cystitis. Used externally, it will aid in the healing of wounds. It is considered to be specific in thrombotic conditions associated with high blood pressure. Another thing about yarrow is um, putting it externally on bruises. So a poultice or a salve, um, you know, just the fresh leaf or flowers crushed up or perhaps the tincture on a cloth on bruises can really help them resolve and heal. And one thing that was impressed to me Oh, um, during herb school is that it's really not um, preferable to let bruises stay on your body. Um, of course, like a bruise is stagnated blood. So ever since then, I've really, this was like five years ago, I really try anytime I have a bruise and, and I bruise really easily. I'm a little clumsy. I do a lot of physical work. So I, I'm always bruising. Um, and I really try to take care of those bruises now, you know, and do a little yarrow poultice, which I'll, I'll talk more about how to do that in a moment, but really to apply yarrow and other herbs to my bruises to help stimulate blood flow to that area and clear out any blood stagnation. Um, so a couple ways to make medicine with yarrow, you can make a tincture, a tea, a hydrosol, a glycerite, a soak or a compress, and um, I'll tell you how to do each one. So if you are making a hot infusion, also known as a tea or tisane, you can use the fresh flowering tops and leaves of the yarrow plant, or you can dry them for later use. And just the word we use as herbalists is garble. So if you want to harvest that yarrow on a dry, sunny day, especially the flowering tops and maybe some leaves along the stem, um, go ahead and chop them up, remove the stem. So it's really just those flowering tops and the leaves, dry them out, and then you can jar them up and use them all season long. And like I mentioned, um, it's good for a diaphoretic tea when you take it internally. It also stimulates the digestion, has a great effect on digestion. However, uh, yarrow is not an herb for regular use. Um, it's not something you wanna be taken every day internally. And it would be more for an acute condition. The, um, oh, I'll, I'll read you the constituents real quick and then we'll talk about why we wouldn't take yarrow internally every day. So this is from Matthew Wood's Earthwise Herbal. The constituents of Achilles are numerous and complex. The leaves and flowers contain flavonoids, vitamin C, bitters, 
tannins, alkaloids, sterols, phen phenylic acids, including salicylates, coumarins, um, volatile oils, including the toxic thujone, irritating borneal, stimulating camphor, anti antiseptic pinenes, and many other constituents. So it's a really strong herb. You don't want to be um, taking that every single day, but if you have a fever or you're experiencing some really stagnant digestion, um, those are some reasons why you might want to take yarrow internally for a short period of time. Externally, feel free to take yarrow as often as you need it. Hopefully you don't need it that often. I hope you're not getting wounds or bruises all the time, but any time that you do, you can feel free to use yarrow. So in the case of um, creating a soak or a compress, you can again use the flowering tops or the leaves. But if you have um, that laceration we mentioned and you want to you know, clean it and put some yarrow leaves on your way to the ER or what have you, um, feel free to just use the leaves. I've, I've never heard of anybody using flowers on a laceration. It's really the crushed leaf um, that is indicated and, and that seems to work so well. Um, I have heard that the leaves and flowers are pretty similar in the constituents. Um, but yeah, when we're making medicine, we're really harvesting those flowering tops, which includes quite a bit of leaf. Um, you can also make a tincture. So you can make a fresh tincture of the flowers. Um, that would be one to two, one part um, fresh yarrow flowers, two parts 95 proof alcohol. If you're making a fresh tincture. Or if you're making a dried tincture, you could do one to five, one part dried yarrow, five parts menstruum at 40% alcohol. So it's really gonna thrive with 60% water, 40% alcohol, that, that's gonna give you um, a nice extraction of those constituents. So you can make your tincture. If you want more information about making tinctures, um, you can check out my online course or just shoot us a message on the chat here and we can go deeper into it. But basically a tincture is just putting together water and alcohol at different ratios with your herb, chopping it up or throwing it in a blender and letting it macerate in a jar for about four weeks until you can strain off that wonderful herbaceous extract and store it in a nice little amber jar and take it in drop doses. Usually one dropper full, which is 30 drops, is a nice dose. If you wanted to work with yarrow energetically, you could take one drop of that tincture, one to five drops, or maybe even just sit with the plant or take a flower essence. And the energetic property of yarrow is that it's very helpful for people who need help cultivating boundaries. So yarrow is associated with Chiron astrologically and the wounded healer. So perhaps the person who is having trouble um, taking on too much um, that is not theirs. You know, somebody is, who's having trouble with that energetic boundary, yarrow, um, and specifically the pink yarrow that grows wild. If you've ever walked through a meadow and seen um, a yarrow with like a pale pink tint, that is really um, the energetic yarrow that you want to sit with, um, from what I've heard. Although, you know, I think all the yarrows can work really nicely for this. Um, it's, it's like, a, you know, sometimes I feel a little funny talking about the energetics right next to the physical constituents. It's really something you got to um, try to believe. You really have to just spend some time sitting in the yarrow patch and meditating to believe it or to take a drop of that medicine and see how it feels in your body. You can approach it with an open mind. Um, my last way that I really like to make medicine with yarrow is and lately my favorite way to make medicine with yarrow is to distill the hydrosol. So yarrow is an incredible um, toner for the skin as well. It has these natural antiseptic and antibacterial and toning qualities. And when you distill it in a, you know, I have this um, copper alembic still. And when I pack the yarrow in there and light the fire underneath it and the water begins to boil and the steam moves through, the yarrow, it activates um, a compound in yarrow called azulene. So um, dried yarrow contains the precursor for azulene, but that steam distillation process activates it. And the way you can tell it's activated is because the hydrosol turns bright blue, um, which is, you know, you, azulene is a bright blue compound. And when you make a tea or a tincture, 
of yarrow, it doesn't turn blue. But if you steam distill it, it you get that gorgeous blue color. Um, azulene has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, and it's wonderfully soothing for sensitive, acne prone or um, mature skin. So I'll be making a distillation of yarrow this week and putting it in my shop as a botanical waters hydrosol. Something I look forward to doing every year. Chamomile also has that same compound in it. So if you distill chamomile, you'll also get a blue hydrosol activating that azulene. Um, see if any questions came up there. Um, I wonder if you have an answer for this, Petra. Um, one of my questions for later will be, what other plants are good friends to yarrow, both for growing and medicinally? I'll just say that I mentioned peppermint and elderflower are um, you know, wonderful synergistic herbs to use with yarrow for assisting a fever. Um, but I wonder if Petra has any thoughts on plants to grow with yarrow. Hmm. I certainly haven't seen yarrow not play well with other plants with the any exception being simply overshadowing and out competing each other just in terms of you know spatial dynamics um and there are so many beneficial insects all over this yarrow even as i'm sitting here i'm like trying not to be distracted by all of the butterflies <laughs> beautiful beings and so many lacewing eggs that i've seen on this yarrow just in the last 10 days even and so it's a really I think yarrow is just one of those plants that it's hard to have too much of and maybe not in between it gets to be quite a large plant and so like planting it companion planting like in between peppers in between broccoli it wouldn't be good in that context but on the end of a bed um, it's a beautiful just like fabulous companion for where you have just enough can give it enough space to do its thing in proximity but not it will definitely overpower lots of plants that it's close to um and oh my gosh I'm curious about this Geraldine I I forget which herbalist told me this years and when I lived in Oregon I made this powder and I don't remember everything that was in it but it was I remember there was dried yarrow leaf and dried plantain leaf. And I think there were a couple other things. And I wonder if you've ever heard of anything along those lines as well. Yeah, so that powder is probably for your first aid kit, like a little styptic powder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a wonderful way to um, you know, get some herbs in your first aid kit, powdered yarrow leaf, powdered plantain leaf. Um, in case you do have a, a cut. I have tried that out before. I think my, um, what I found is that like for me personally, the fresh leaf worked a little bit better, but I also like, I feel like I carried a powder like that in my first aid kit for a long time and I never really got to use it. <laughs> like it just, it just didn't like come up that sometimes when you, oh, when you have that little remedy, the thing doesn't happen. And then as soon as you don't have it, the thing happens. Um, so I didn't really get to test it out too much, but um, I've definitely seen that reference before and, and it makes sense, but yeah, from my personal experience, it's that fresh leaf that I've worked with. Um, oh, did you have something, Petra? Okay. Um, I just, I did want to mention somebody in the comments said, um, uh, yarrow is my favorite. I'm in Rochester, New York, and I have a little patch of yarrow in my plot at South Wedge Victory Garden. I use the tincture for menstrual cramps. And I just wanted to um, comment on that because in many old herbals, you'll hear yarrow called the master of the blood and all venous um, afflictions. It's known to be a um, normalize, have a normalizing effect on blood and moving through the vessels. I personally don't use it for menstrual cramps. There are or other herbs I turn to like catnip, which we talked about um, in a recent webinar, but I definitely have seen that indication before. If you've been to these bioregional herbalism webinars before, you know that I pretty much only talk about the properties that I have direct experience with, um, but many herbs have so many wonderful properties you can read about. Um, but yeah, so yeah, menstrual cramps, I've definitely heard that. 
but I haven't experienced it personally. Let's see. Question, here's a question from Maggie. One moment, I have to plug in my computer. Um, question for later, is there much difference at all in the medicinal properties of different varieties of yarrow, like pink yarrow versus moonshine yarrow, et cetera? So what I know about that is that um, the white yarrow, kind of the wild type of yarrow, seems to be um, the most medicinally active, and especially when it's growing, like we mentioned, in those more, um, you know, rough conditions, like where it's not growing in like a super mulched, moist garden, but when it's growing, it has a little bit more of a chance to produce those secondary um, compounds, those, those um, medicinal compounds that yarrow produces when it is in poor soil, rough soil. But um, Petra did say to, when you're first planting your yarrow to give it lots of water to make sure it's watered in and give it a little food for the road a little um, fertilization uh, petra was sharing that in our last webinar just like the importance of really giving our plants snacks when we plant them in the form of fertilizer for later and i really took that home and i've been fertilizing all of my plants a little bit more than i normally would and they are so happy and it makes me so happy um Oh, Gail Phillips says, do you have recommendations for transplanting and how to use as a natural dye? So to use as a natural dye, I've only done this a few times because most of the time when I'm growing yarrow, I need a huge amount to make a hydrosol to pack that still. I need all the yarrow. So that's what I really like. I'll do that and I'll make a little yarrow tincture and I'll dry a little bit. Um, and then by the time I'm done making medicine, there's not much left over for a natural dye, but it does produce a nice green yellow, but there are, are other plants that do too. So I tend to use them. Um, and I am going to throw it to Petra for transplanting recommendations. Transplanting recommendations. Just be sure that you always acclimate your seedlings before you transplant them. That phenomena of, especially if they're grown inside where, you know, the temperature is pretty be stable and the humidity is pretty stable and <laughs> it's pretty consistent in your kitchen um, at, or in your greenhouse wherever you're growing them indoors where you bring them outside and suddenly there's wind and rain and the sun is you no matter the nicest <laughs> grow light that you might have there's nothing that you is like the sun in the world. And so acclimating your plant from indoors life to outdoors life is crucial. So that like four or five day period where you're not watering them unless they're like bone dry and just letting them acclimate to all of that, all of those dynamic factors. If you are starting them now, you can, there's no reason to start seeds, honestly, indoors right now. In the middle of the summer, you can be starting them outdoors. And so in that way, you don't have to harden them off, which is really, really nice. And I love when I'm transplanting to dunk the transplants into dilute fish emulsion as I'm plant before I plant them out. So that way, that water that helps just keep all that cohesion helps all the soil and rootlets just like transplant cleanly and you're not like disturbing the root system on as you're transplanting them it also so dunking them in water showering them fully in water is just a good idea and adding that touch of fish emulsion compost tea worms cat worm castings tea just like geraldine mentioned that's like the snacks for the journey <laughs> their plants are totally climbing a mountain so those are some tips for transplanting. Also, I just love to mention that yarrow is absurdly easy to transplant. I do mean divide. And so I like to say three years, but honestly, it depends if they're really stressed in the first three years of their life. They might not be large enough at year three necessarily to have much to divide. But I mean, this yarrow behind me, <laughs> Holy moly, at the end of year one, it was, we could have divided it into seven parts and all of them would have been thrilled. So depending on the health of the plant, you can do a lot of dividing and it's as simple as taking a shovel and then every root is sacred, but don't think twice as you just slice through that root system. And then it's ideal to be transplanting them in spring as they're breaking their dormancy. 
or in fall is a second. You can also transplant them in summer and they'll do all right. Um, they definitely won't die. They just won't be as quick to take off. But without doubt, I mean, you can certainly start yarrow from seed, but yarrow from a transplant, from a division, um, a propagated just root cutting is hands down the easiest way to transplant and to establish a new yarrow patch. Thank you for that, Petra. Mm. We have a note from Becky. Becky says, I use powdered yarrow for when I cut myself, works great. Thank you for sharing that, Becky. Um, and then we also have two questions about um, yarrow's topical use for wounds. So Becky says, question about making salves for bruises with yarrow. I was under the impression that the volatile oils in yarrow evaporate from the plant very quickly. Is it possible to make a high quality salve with yarrow that has these volatile oils in it? Yeah, so you're definitely right. Like water and alcohol, um, hydrosol, those are the best ways to extract those volatile oils. But you can extract some if you dry it very quickly and then make a salve with it. Um, but if you really want to get the highest concentration of those volatile oils onto your skin, the best way is to really make a standard infusion as if you were going to be drinking a big tea of it, which most of the time you wouldn't really be drinking yarrow as a big tisane by itself. It just, there's no reason to do that. It doesn't taste very good. It's not something you want to be taking in like large quality quantities all the time. Um, but so you would just make a standard infusion and instead of drinking it, you could stick a washcloth in it and then, um, and even wrap up some of the herb, like those flowers and leaves in the washcloth and hold that to the bruise or to the wound. And that makes an effective wound wash as well, share those antiseptic properties um, with the wound. And then the second question was specifically, how do you use yarrow to treat bruises? Okay, we did just say, and for open wounds, did you say use the leaves directly on the wound or the flower? Yeah, use the leaves. Like if you have that cut and like um, you're on the way you to the next step, um, use the leaves, crush up those yarrow leaves and put them on your wound. And you'll be amazed at how yarrow wants to just stitch up a deep wound. Make sure it's clean first because it will stitch it up and you don't want to stitch up a dirty wound. So that's really important. Um, is yarrow something we can grow indoors during winter? What do you think, Petra? I have never honestly tried. I doubt that it would flower, but I could imagine that it would be, if not an abundant leaf, a surviving leaf. <laughs> Especially, although I would definitely I encourage you to have a grow light and a really nice, not just, you know, plants know the difference between a dentist's office <laughs> and like a really nice full spectrum LED grow light. Um, so I think with a, with a really nice grow light, with the ones that we share, I'm really confident that yarrow, I doubt that it would flower though. I don't know, but I am really confident that you'd have plenty of leaves um, and certainly plenty for for medicine making. But I'm really excited. If anyone tries growing yarrow over the winter, let me know. So excited to hear next steps. Mm. Um, I'm excited to hear too. Sh send us your pictures of yarrow growing indoors. That could be a cool way to bring some sunshine to your winter. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, so Rebecca says, since you wouldn't recommend using yarrow daily, what would be the maximum frequency amount you'd suggest for a yarrow tincture? Yeah, great question. So if somebody is dealing with a digestive complaint that I feel is very specific to yarrow, I might have them take a tincture with, you know, maybe yarrow as a supporting herb. So it wouldn't be the key herb um, or a catalyst, but it'd be like maybe the second most potent herb in the formula or second most plentiful herb in the formula. Um, and I would have them maybe take that for six weeks maximum. And that would be a lot, like four to six weeks. But for the for a person who it's really indicated for, that can be really helpful. And then that would be it. You know, this is not like a low, low dose botanical where you have to worry about toxicity. And um, it's just not, it's not like Tulsi or chamomile. It's not one that like your body is going to love having every single day for extended periods. And it's by no means an adaptogen. Do you know what I mean? 
Um, it's, so it's not like, we're not talking about like a, a strict maximum dose, more just to keep in mind that this is not an herb for daily consumption. If you're just looking at the properties and thinking, oh, I could use this. I like, you know, it might be listed in some places as like, oh, an anti-inflammatory herb. Like I want anti-inflammatories like turmeric in my life. Um, but it's not anti-inflammatory in the same way. And so you wouldn't want to take this one every day the way you might want to take turmeric every day. So just some, that does that make sense, Rebecca? You can let us know. Um, Joanna says, what resources do you recommend to know more about herbs? That is a great question. Oh my goodness. So I have a course called Bioregional Herbalism and Medicine Making. I really tried to pack in a few years of wor workshops and um, my whole experience of being an herbalist for the past 10 years into that course. And I also have a course booklet. Um, and at the end of that course booklet, all my favorite herbal books. So you could check out my course um, or you could shoot me a message after this and ask me for that list of books and I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, Follow-up question from Gail Phillips. How about transplanting an adult plant, Petra? Easy and awesome. If it's if it has been growing not necessarily outdoors yet, make sure you harden it off. But otherwise, just make sure that you shower it with water, ideally with a little bit of snack in there, whether it's fish emulsion, compost tea, worm castings tea, and then just tuck it in the ground. Um, yeah, yarrow, honestly, there are lots of plants that genuinely need TLC in their lives. Um, and yarrow honestly doesn't need a lot of it. So if you have a healthy ad adult plant that is ready to go in the ground, um, you know, take as much care as you can, but know that it's almost not even necessary. It'll just help them establish that much easier and more quickly. But yeah, if you can dig that hole, put compost and some maybe organic slow release fertilizer in the bottom for that, those snacks over the long haul, that's amazing. Um, but oh, don't think twice. You have on your hands this incredibly resilient <laughs> plant that you can basically plant wherever you would like and it will just instantly do its thing. There aren't too many plants that I would say that so fully and callously almost. <laughs> but Yarrow, I feel really confident that, yeah, if you've got an already established adult plant, that it's honestly going to be challenging <laughs> to put it somewhere where it's not going to thrive. <laughs> Thank you for that, Petra. Um, oh, and we have a few people commenting that um, Becky says, I use yarrow during my period for the first few days, one dropper full, one to three times daily. And Emily says, same, Becky, the tincture offers almost instant relief for me with cramps, although mine are relatively mild. I don't usually take more than three dropper fulls a day when menstruating. So that's awesome information. Um, I, you know, different herbs, different properties for menstrual cramps, I tend to use um, a combination of catnip and um, kava and, um, oh, what else is in my formula? I'm blanking right now, but I, I have a different formula that I use for cramps. It's wonderful to have lots of different herbs in your apothecary. And hey, I might just try yarrow next time. So thanks for sharing that, Becky and Emily. We have a question from Carol Scully saying, could you review the proportions yarrow alcohol water for tinctures again? Thank you. Okay, sure. So if you're making a fresh tincture, you're going to the garden right now and you're harvesting, it's like a beautiful sunny day and you're harvesting those flowering tops, um, you're gonna bring them inside and I'm telling you the proportions for a ratio tincture. You are always also welcome to make a folk style tincture, which would include just chopping up those herbs and pouring alcohol over them so that the herb is submerged. But what I usually do is ratio method. So that here's that. So you've harvested your herb, you've chopped it up, and now you're weighing it on a scale. And let's say for easy math on the fly, that that yarrow um, equaled 100 grams total. Okay, so then I might put it in a blender or you could put it in a jar. And then you measure out 200 milliliters in a graduated cylinder of 95% alcohol. So that is foolproof moonshine level, just like foolproof alcohol. And that's what I really like to use for fresh plants most of the time because they contain all the water they need for that extraction. So I combine 
the 200 milliliters of foolproof alcohol with the 100 um, grams of yarrow in the blender because it was one to two for fresh herbs with foolproof alcohol, blend them up and then I scoop it into a jar, press the yarrow so that it's below the level of alcohol or menstruum. Now we have the mark, the herb in the tincture is our mark and the liquid is our menstruum and I label it yarrow, sun trap garden, the date. Um, and I put it in a cabinet and I try to give it a little shake every day because time and agitation are going to help us extract those medicinal properties from yarrow into that aqueous alcoholic um, menstruum, that tincture. And so after four weeks, you can strain the liquid from the herb and you have your beautiful tincture. So if you're doing a dried tincture, say you, you harvested that yarrow and you dried it, the way you're going to do it is you measure out 100 grams of dried yarrow, and then you measure out 500 milliliters of alcohol. Only this time, you're going to dilute your alcohol so that it's 40% alcohol and 60% water. And then you add that um, those 500 milliliters of alcohol and water to your dried yarrow tincture and you blend it up or you, you don't have to use a blender if you don't want, you could just chop it and combine it. I like to use a blender, it really exposes so much surface area. I feel like I'm getting a really strong extraction personally, blend it up and then the same process, put it in a jar with a label, date, place, um, any information that you think might be useful, put it in um, a cabinet, let it sit for four to six weeks and then you can strain and give it a little um, shake every time you think of it. And um, there's just one more comment right now and it says shout out for Geraldine's course. I'm loving it. I love that you're loving it, Rebecca. Thank you for sharing that, really appreciate it. And it looks like we have four minutes left. Um, any more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I love that so many people sh showed up for this workshop today. Yarrow is such a beloved plant and we all have our own personal experience with it. It is almost ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We all know and love yarrow. And I hope that you learned something today. I definitely learned something um, as I always do coming to these webinars. So thank you for showing up and we'll be coming at you again in July um, with a different herb if you have any desired bioregionally abundant herbs that you'd like us to talk about, feel free to send us a message or let us know in the chat. We're always listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, friends. Thank you so much, Kira. Thank you so much, Geraldine. I can't wait for next time. <laughs> oh, cool to hear that Emily. Emily says, um, that she picked up instinct tincture at Bramble. What a wonderful place. Bramble, community support mm. for herbalism in Ithaca. We love it. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. <laughs> time to relax and go smell mm. the yarrow. <laughs> mm.